Hello everybody, I'm Brad Cohen, I'm the mayor of the Township of East Brunswick, and I'm here today to try to initiate a series of discussions with local uh, politicians, elected officials, who represent us and, and be able to have an opportunity to talk about many of the issues that not only affect New Jersey, but in particularly affect East Brunswick and those towns that are, are in our vicinity. I'm lucky to start this series out today with the Speaker of the Assembly, Craig Coughlin. Mayor, pleasure and privilege to be here with you today. Thank you so much. I think before we go into any real political questions, okay. let's just sort of, uh, um, you're a Middlesex County guy, so make us through proud. Through and through. Born and raised in South Amboy, uh, actually born in part of the Amboy uh, General Hospital and great, grew up in South Amboy. Uh, my, my wife is from, uh, from at the Avenel section of Woodbridge. Uh, we moved to the Ford section of Woodbridge about uh, 25 years ago, and that's where we've made our home with my my three sons, uh, all of whom went to the through the Woodbridge public school system. Um, I have family uh, certainly throughout my legislative district, which is the 19th district: Woodbridge, Sarville, South Amboy, Perth Amboy, Cotteret. Um and have lived proudly here in Middlesex uh, all of my life. Well, I know that you uh, have been doing a lot of different things in terms of your political career, and now, uh, fortunately for the whole entire state, but we're, again, we're proud of Middlesex, you serve as the Speaker of the Assembly. Maybe you could just speak a couple of seconds about what the, what's life like being sure. Speaker well, of the Assembly? Well, it's different, uh, and, and thanks for that, that, you know, that kind introduction. Yeah. It, it, it's been an interesting journey uh, uh, to get here. I was first elected to the uh, South Amboy Board of Education right after I got out of law school in 19, well, first appointed and then elected in 1984, ran for the city council in South Amboy in 1986 and uh, served there until 1992 when, when my, my wife Tish and I had our second son. and. Um, you know, it's a, the the rigors of being involved in local government are mm -hmm. such, uh, even in a small community like South Amboy, uh, that I didn't think we were getting to spend enough time with the, with the kids. And so I took the next 17 years off, <laughs> uh, coached little league, was president of the little league association. You know, did those kind of things, drove the kids around, Cub Scouts, and now we have all boys. And Lived in the car, right? Uh, in, in the car, car. yeah. Uh, and and um, then got to be situation occurred where I it was a, it was a short term I uh, I got selected to be the uh, the candidate uh, in 19 I'm sorry in 2009 and that's when I first got elected to the uh, to the assembly and then um, fortunately my name came up as a potential candidate back in uh, in about the 2000 and uh, what was it? I guess it was probably 17 mm -hmm. uh, or 16, actually. I guess the end of 16, um, and and went about the process of of trying to get to be the speaker. And it has been a remarkable journey. Uh, it is an incredible honor uh, to serve as the leader of the the General Assembly, People's House, as we like to call That's it. That's right. Um, for folks who don't know, we have like two seconds of a civics lesson. There's two houses. Uh, there's the Senate and the General Assembly. Uh, each district is represented by one senator and two assembly people. And so there's 80 assembly people and, and 40 senators. Um, but it, 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 being able to, to be the leader of the house, being able to, to be the speaker, uh, puts you right in the middle of, of all of the things that are going on in the state of New Jersey. And I think uh, what is true of all of us who uh, seek public office, who, who want to serve their community, is that you, you want to do good things and you want to have a chance to make a difference and to matter. And the being the speaker has given me a, a, an unbelievable opportunity, an opportunity that candidly I never thought I would have to, to matter uh, and to be so involved in, in all of the things that go on in the state. Uh, and so it's been just a, a tremendous uh, thing to do. Um, now it's d constantly demanding, uh, and uh, it is multi-dimensional, uh, but it is a a remarkable uh, thing. And and with it comes, the, you know, the the challenges of being in charge and to 
we're a legislative body, so right. our, our goal is to have good ideas and uh, then to try to get them to become laws that actually have some meaning and effect. Um, you know, if you, the critical numbers in, in Trenton are 41, 21, and 1. <laughs> if you can't right. get 41, 21, and 1, you've, you may have a good idea, but you don't have a law. Right. Uh, and so that is part of the challenge. Uh, and to try and, and do good things and keep uh, all of the things that are priorities for so many people uh, in, in line uh, is, is really you know, a, a, a demanding challenge, but one that is certainly well worth it. Well, I think from what I've seen in my short career in politics now, like you, I took a, a large time off to raise my family and came in to that a little bit later. But most of the people I see are doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have differences of opinion on how to get from A to B, but, right. but they're there for the right reasons. And sort of that is a good segue into the first thing I was going to ask about, which is the things that most voters see are the things that hit the papers or hit the social media sure. or whatever way that they get their news. And uh, so the big news this summer was, of course, the budget hearings and the fact that we couldn't get to any consensus or conclusion until the very last minute. Mm -hmm. and my understanding is you paid a very critical role in trying to broker um, what people are uh, coming from so many different points of view and to try to get something at the end. Maybe talk a little bit about the angst in the community. Many people feel that there's those that are on the side that feel you didn't go far enough mm -hmm. and that if you want any real change in government, we're going to have to make some very hard decisions that we really didn't re uh, get to. And then there's those that are on the other side that look at taxes and costs as the number one deciding factor in any election. And anytime you spend any money, they're a big fat no on that. And how did you come to where you came to in terms of a a, a compromise. So you're right, and it was it was a remarkable experience for the first time. I've you know I've been in the served in the legislature for eight years, and and had the opportunity to go through a number of budgets, but not in the position of the speaker. And uh, it is it is fundamentally different uh, when you're in in charge. Um, and and so. What you do need to do is to, to try to reconcile, as, as I, I had talked about a little bit, you need to try and reconcile those people. It, that there is a difference of opinion is a really good and healthy thing. Sure. Uh, what it means is that there are thinking people uh, who have, or ought to be, uh, you know, passionate about what, what they believe in. We're all charged with representing the 250 or 225,000, give or take, 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, in our legislative districts, but recognize that we have an obligation to all nine million people in the state of New Jersey. Um, and that's why it takes, it takes a real uh, commitment to getting things done and to comp understanding that in order to do that, you're going to, to need to compromise. And so what I think we, we did in this budget, uh, and I think which is uh, something that all of us who run for office are faced with. I think what, what we need to do is, is, is set out, first and foremost, your priorities. Understand what's important to you. I think it's important to tell voters that uh, when you run so that they, 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 they know what they're going to get mm -hmm. if you get elected. Uh, I think that's important in terms of being able to negotiate a $37.5 billion budget. Uh, and so, the compromise then comes on balancing all those because there's two sides to an equation. There's the the spending side and sure. the, the revenue side, um, or the investment side, as, as we like to call it. Uh, and so you, you overlay that with the notion that you need to get 41, 21, and one, <laughs> uh, and and recognize that the consequences of not getting to that. Uh, involve shutting down the state because constitutionally, Mayor, as you know, uh, we we have to have a budget in place by uh, June 30th, uh, and if we don't, then the the, the governor's charged to putting in place a, a plan to close the state. We just we don't have the constitutional right. ability to operate beyond that, with some exceptions, obviously essential personnel, state police, things right. like that. Uh, because ultimately we, we always get to can't, a budget right. and the physician we can't the let the emergencies go correct but emergencies don't come back right no. you have to you, you have to solve them at, at that time um, 
but the weight of that, and it, you know, it just did, as an aside, and one of the things that struck me as we went through this process was that there, we talk a lot about the beaches and the parks, and those are things that have a direct adverse effect on folks who have vacations planned and all that stuff. But it's the myriad of other services that will be adversely affected, and that will really affect people in their day-to-day -day lives, transportation for sure. disabled people, you know, unemployment checks, thing, you know, uh, road projects have to get closed down and taken away because there's nobody to oversee it from the state side. And so that did actually happen the year before. It did. It did. We were we were closed down through July 4th. I think, right. clo I think we finally that. passed the budget around midnight, so it may have been the 5th when we actually did it. Uh, but so that the weight of all that comes. And so that's what, what I think we did in this budget. Um, we had a whole bunch of, uh, of, of different ideas about how we got to a balanced budget, because constitutionally our budget has to, it has to be balanced, has to be done by the 30th. Um, and, and so you, you set out your own priorities in terms of, the, you know, here's the goals we want to achieve, and that's, that's done through the spending side. Uh, and here is what we, here's where we're going to raise the money to do that. And so I think at the end of the day, what we got was a product that was very, very good for folks in New Jersey. So do you think then that um, with the compromise that you came up with, where you're able to hit significantly some of the governor's major targets, the school funding, mm -hmm. the pensions, the uh, New Jersey transit, these were his priorities. Well, certainly they were the governors, and, and I think they were, in, and the spending side uh, was was uh, was not really the contentious side in this budget negotiations. It was the, the revenue side. Uh, yes, I think we, and we did that, and I think we did really good things for the for the taxpayers of New Jersey in this budget. You know, we, it, it was a shared goal of the of the Senate President and myself and the, and the governor uh, to, to do things like Increase school funding, uh, and and we did that. Mm -hmm. uh, we accomplished that. To uh, we added, in fact, the legislative bu uh, budget that was first adopted, uh, he added three hundred million dollars uh, to to the to the amount the governor had already increased it by, um, and that coupled with the property or the uh, school funding reform that we were able to get done uh, meant things like an extra half a million dollars for for East Brunswick. Uh, and for most schools in, or most school districts in, in Middlesex County, they saw an increase in their funding because we changed the right. formula. Uh, we increased the property tax deduction uh, f for New Jersey re on, on the state side to take into account the, 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 the really ha bad legislation that came right. out of, of Washington see. that really hurt New Jersey property taxpayers. So we increased it from 10 to 15 thousand uh, dollars as a deduction. And that cost 80 some odd million dollars. We did a number of those kind of good things. Put more money into New Jersey Transit and I suspect that's sure. one of the things you're going to want to talk about. Yeah. We just had some hearings about that and because New Jersey Transit was once the premier commuter line in the country and now is not and we need to get back there. So um, those are the kind of priorities uh, that, that I think we set and we achieved. Uh, and we were able to work out a compromise on how we went about uh, getting money to pay for it. I think that's the goal of government. I mean, I, if we're going to sit there and yell at one another and accomplish nothing, then then it makes people equally unhappy with whatever side you're on. It doesn't, I sure. think, matter. Well, accomplishing nothing is never, is, right, uh, is never a solution, backwards. right? Exactly. Uh, and so, yes, you have to yeah, you have to ultimately uh, stand for things and get some things done. We, I think we did. Can I switch topics a second? We have a, a big issue in town right now, and we're not different than any other town with our COA obligation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that most people in town have an issue with the concept of affordable housing. I think most people understand New Jersey is an extraordinarily difficult state to live in, and you want your kids to be able to move here and live here and raise families the way we did. We don't want our seniors to have to be forced to leave because now they're on fixed incomes Correct. and can't afford to live here anymore. So I think people get that. What they don't get is the uh, latching on of the 80 percent that the developers are now forcing on communities where you can't establish real demand for full price units. And mm -hmm. so it's forcing development in parts of town <coughs> that we don't want it and it now allows uh, developers to come in and demand building where we don't really need it, whereas in our particular instance we have parts of town that clearly need redevelopment, which are two totally different things. Uh, and to the average person in town, they just see 
massive development. Uh, and it takes away from the argument of putting development where it's needed um, as opposed to having it shoved down the throat of, of town residents that, that are having these places built where they don't need them. And how do we resolve, uh, it seems to be it's kind of stuck at the state right now. Is there any resolution coming on that? Well, we're, we're certainly, that's something that we're working on. And, and I think that's one of the things that we re, whose time has come and we need to address that issue. Because you're right when you say uh, there are some real challenges in that area. We do, New Jersey's not an inexpensive place to live. In fact, no. it's too expensive. But, uh, and that's true of housing as well. Uh, we have, uh, they're, and they're really, I, I look at them as two sides of the coin. Uh, we, I think we all recognize that we do not have enough low and moderate income housing uh, in the state. Uh, that poses a challenge for seniors, that poses a challenge for uh, people with disabilities, that, that pose, you know, poses a challenge for uh, the working poor. It, 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 cr it creates a whole lot of, of issues. Um, on the other side of that coin, uh, we recognize that, you know, I think, I think municipalities do a good job uh, and have, uh, of, of trying to manage the growth within their communities. Um, I know you have undertaken, the, the, the township of East Brunswick has undertaken uh, the challenge of getting rid of the two, probably the two biggest eyesores, right, right along Route 18, exactly. which is, uh, uh, you know, the corridor that really introduces what is a, a beautiful, lovely community uh, to, to folks, and, you, and you're taking on those, the challenge of trying to find, I think you're doing a national search, if I'm not wrong, yes. uh, to try and find developers to, to come in and, and to turn that into something as special as the, the township deserves. Uh, and, and so we have, to, we have to figure out how we strike that balance between achieving the goal of, uh, of having, uh, creating increased number of affordable housing units uh, and allowing municipalities who are thoughtful and uh, caring about the, the, the needs of their residents and taxpayers uh, to, to be able to come to some balance of, of how we, we, we do that uh, without allowing uh, an overdevelopment uh, which, which poses other challenges, sure. right? In, in terms of infrastructure, roads, so it's beyond services. Beyond that, it's, it's an unsubstantiated um, need. And so my fear over time is that you're going to put so much development in that can't get the market prices that the builders think they're going to get. And then it ends up costing them, um, either it becomes vacant space because they can't sell it or they reduce the price, and it doesn't end up ever meeting with the town's needs, and now we're just overdeveloped. Right. Well, we certainly want to, Try to avoid address that. that. Yeah. Uh, and we've begun that. So uh, Assemblyman Wemberly, Chairman Wemberly, is the chairman of the Housing Committee for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, the uh, the assembly has begun to have hearings on, on that to first to try to define the problem and then to work towards a solution I think uh, one of the things that I have tried to make the hallmark of the assembly uh, and have lots of willing or 80 willing participants is to try and be thorough and thoughtful in the way we approach everything uh, I think our our constituents well, they ought to demand it. They certainly deserve it. Sure. Um, and I, I think as issue, an issue as, as challenging as this will be, and it will be. Sure, it's got a scientific um, approach to it. You have to um, be very... Right, but you have to go through it methodically. You have exactly. to first understand what... You have to define the problem, and then you can f define the solution. And so we've begun that process. Um, it's not, it's not going to be resolved quickly. I wouldn't think so. Uh, because it requires so much thought and attention. But... Um, you know, a journey of a million miles begins with the first step. It's absolutely true. And, uh, and we've done that. You know, we've taken that first step. And now we're going to try to, you know, being thorough and thoughtful doesn't mean you have to be slow and, and uh, you, can, you can work hard no, and fast. No, I mean the towns are, um, are craving a, a solution right. before we're ready for the 2025 um, you know, <laughs> list of next round of, next rounds yeah. of obligations. Yeah. So, um, well, well, we'll have them done before 2025. I'll <laughs> make you. that commitment right here. Thank right now. you. Uh, but, we're, you know, um, we're looking to do that sooner rather than later. Can I switch to the schools for a second? Sure. As both of us started on the school board side. We did. And, um, and it's a huge commitment on the part of anybody that puts time into school it boards. It absolutely is. 
The, um, the concept, of course, that uh, trying to redo uh, the funding formula has been something we've discussed as a state for very many, a long time. And um, yet it's some states see it as something to emulate, that, that we do something that most other states wouldn't do. And no one can argue that our public school system, compared to most other states, still stands one or two every year. It, Absolutely. It, it, so it's great public schools and uh, we must give thanks to the teachers and administrators and the parents that you know, demand that. The um, school funding formula, as most people know, is based in large part on the economics of a community so that those people that don't have the ability to pay get more state aid than those that do. And so since it's ranked on an A to a J by letter ranking, East Brunswick's an I. So we get, we're basically one under the most affluent communities. And we did get it back $562,000 this year. Um, but I guess the problem I for the residents... I only claim credit for 500 so, uh, so extra 62 was a bonus. But the problem is that school boards um, have to make that decision on whether or not they're actually going to give that back to the taxpayer in the sure. form of tax relief or they're going to use it. Sure. So it, a lot of residents here, the school board in, in our instance, for whatever reason, did not give any of that back to the residents. So despite the fact that the... Um, the money was came back that's not realized in any tax relief here. You want to talk a little bit about how school funding works so that people have a clearer sure. idea? Sure. And so um, the first thing I thought of is what the, the, and the courts have held in the constitutional obligation to provide a thorough and efficient education to all the students in the state of New Jersey. And, I, and we do much more than that. One of the things I think uh, New Jersey doesn't get enough credit for, for sure, and I, I'm not even sure we claim enough credit for it, uh, is our <coughs> remarkable commitment uh, to public education and the enormous success that we had, as you point out. Yeah. Uh, every year, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Maryland are the three best public school systems. Sometimes we're one, sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, three best public school systems in a nation, by far. We spend and invest billions of dollars in its, you know, uh, one of my fellow legislators said, uh, you know, we invest $5 billion in education, and we kind of snickered at that. You know? that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not even a good start. Um, but you get what you pay for. But you do get what you pay for, and, and I think that uh, we, we do. You know, we have a tremendous, we export, and what it's, in, some, in some level it's a challenge, and in some levels I think it's a credit to our school systems, is we export more students than any state in the nation. Um, We'd like to keep the talent home. I know, I know that's what we're working on. But the truth of the matter is, is that one of the reasons we do that is because our students are so good uh, that they get the pick of colleges throughout the country. Um, and so, uh, but you have to pay for that. And we pay for it through property taxes. And as, as you know, as a mayor, as a board member, as mm -hmm. a taxpayer, uh, the biggest piece of everybody's property tax bill is for public Schools, education. Right. Uh, what we do in Trenton to try and help that is to provide additional funding, and we did to the tunes of billions of dollars again this year. Uh, and, and this year we even added more. But there's a formula that has to be followed, as you, as you talked about. Uh, and the, the funding level is supposed to achieve what's called adequacy, and this is just a right. two-second overview. Adequacy sounds like some empirical standard. What it really is is a combination of a municipal contribution and state contribution so that we get to adequacy, so everybody's doing. Um, and there is actually, is part of that formula, a, a per pupil uh, recognition of, of allocation. But the formula, as it existed prior to uh, the governor having signed it into effect uh, this year, uh, didn't in take into account shifts in Demo shifts in school population. So if you had more students, you should get more money. If you lost students, you shouldn't. Consequently, the f and, and if people were, some communities weren't funding their portion of the, of the, on, the, on the, their, their side. Uh, and so it got out of skew, and there were, there were uh, in, there's probably only a hundred, a hundred and some uh, communities that were, uh, had, were overfunded, and they, right. Have, they're going to see reduced uh, uh, school aid, uh, but for most communities, including East Brunswick, Woodbridge, where I live, um, we were chronically underfunded, uh, and and so this formula now takes into uh, eliminates the growth caps, eliminates the adjustment aid, and I think achieves a fairer. Um, 
distribution of the school uh, funding. And so, and we have to take into account, we, you can't, we don't ever want to hurt students. We don't ever not no, allow the school districts to provide absolutely. their own efficient educations. And so there, there are glide paths. This is not a one time. It, you're going to continue to see this implemented over a seven year period. Um, and, and, and look, the school board will make the right decision about how it, what it does with the money. Um, and some communities will obviously see a declining scale over those seven years. So th that's how it will work. And, it, and at the end, I think, and we'll, look, we're going to continue to try to find ways to increase school funding. Because one of the things school, f school funding is when the state sends it to is property tax relief. More money, I, I, or, or it can be. It could be, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the more money we send, the, the less the, the tax burden has to be. And so that's the way that funding formula exists. That's why there was a recognition that, that as with the housing, you know, sometimes these are just ideas whose time has come and we need to do it. And we, so we did, we solved it. Right. With a uh, little time left, I want to talk a little bit about the other big issue in our town, which is roads. And of course, there's roads that are county roads, there's roads that are state roads, there's roads that are our own and, and our responsibility. But um, our biggest commercial corridor is obviously Route 18, mm -hmm. and um, we recently sat down with the Department of Transportation. They're going to do some major overhauls, especially in some of the worst hit areas. But um, good on thank gosh because <laughs> people are losing axles, uh, not even tires anymore. And uh, but it was interesting because we went down to the Department of Transportation, and it looked like this massive building that was out of an old. Um, movie where there's lots of cubicles that people work in with their little computers and their desks and their uh, cabinets, but there was no one there. Yeah. And it sort of drove home to me uh, the years of budget cuts and mm -hmm. cutting uh, staff that you're now down to a level, and I'm told that that's very much a lot of other departments too, where if uh, residents want work done, it's going to be difficult because like a tree, if you cut the branches off, it's ultimately going to die. You can only cut so much and improve things mm -hmm. and cut too much, it dies. Right. Um, where are we with trying to keep our budgets in place but be able to provide enough people to do the services that we need? We're gonna not get our Route 18 corridor done in any real repaving effort now till 2020 or 2021, other than these patches that they're gonna do now. Yeah, I think, so uh, that's, that's a, a tricky question, right? How many, what's what's the right size number of employees? And, and to your point, you have to recognize if somebody's not doing that job, then that job isn't getting done. The, you know, the folks in Trenton do real work. I mean, there are uh, folks who go to work every day and make sure that the things that sure. we, we need to get done are getting done and getting done properly. I mean, that's the purpose of having, you know, the state overlay. Um, I think we've put the, the money in place to allow the governor to go ahead and, and have the, the number of employees uh, that he thinks is right. Uh, and I think, I, I think we're, we're going to get there. And uh, we may need to do some things in the short term to help speed things along. And, you know, we'll, I'll trust his, his wisdom on that. I hope so. The, um, I'm a physician, and obviously one of my uh, big concerns, obviously, is the health care of the, my patients and, 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 and health care in general in the state. Uh, and that's providing the care and then, of course, paying for it, which are not always the exact same thing. Right. Um, you should be very proud about your bill that just went through with the uh, added network benefits. I thought maybe in the few minutes that we have left, you might want to discuss that. And in particular, um, East Brunswick is a, is a home to a lot of physicians mm -hmm. since the two big hospitals are in our backyard right, right. in New Brunswick. How um, are, is, does that bill deal with the ability for physicians to stand in some level of equity with insurance companies to make sure that they get their fair um, share of, of the work that they've uh, put into under the under the that bill? Sure, we, uh, we call it the. It has a very long title because it has to do with <laughs> transparency and cost savings and and out of that right? But really, in its essence, what the, the what the bill does for folks who may not be familiar with it is, and, but it is a situation that we're all in. Uh, sure. Everyone knows, either firsthand or secondhand. I don't know anybody who's ever gotten beyond secondhand. Uh, where you go to the to a hospital, for example, to have some surgery, and uh, you have done your work. You've gone to an in-network doctor. You've gone to an in-network hospital, and now you meet. Um, someone in, in the hospital will provide some services for you, generally an anesthesiologist, pathologist, radiologist, right. something like that, whom you have not had the chance to, to 
to understand. And what this bill does is for the people who it covers, remember, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there's, we only regulate about a third of the, of the which are provided by commercial plans. That's all the state regulates. Other plans where you're self-insured are ERISA plans, federally regulated. We don't have any authority. To go. But in those plans, uh, the bill provides that, the, that what happened, what was happening, would, is that the doctor would send a bill, be an out-of-network uh, treatment, the, the insurance carrier would, would deny it, uh, and the patient would get put in the middle uh, and, and often- It's happened to me, it's yeah, very Yeah, it happens unfair. all the time. Right. Uh, and it happens to everybody. You, we, everybody, I know. You have, if you right. have a baby, if you have a procedure, if you do whatever, all of a sudden you get a bill from somebody you don't know who the heck they are. Right. Um, and, uh, and so that, but what we've tried to do is get the, the patient out of that. And, and so you can't balance what's called balance bill, balance bill that patient. Docs and, and insurance companies, uh, you need to square that away between the two of right, you. Which is very fair which, and which long be. overdue. So, but to, to the, the doctors in the audience, <laughs> uh, who didn't like the bill in all fairness, uh, we set up a, an arbitration system. Uh, which allows uh, for the doctor and the and the and the to pro the carrier uh, to on an expedited basis because it's a very short period of time under the bill uh, to come to some conclusion, uh, but uh, you know and, and is designed to allow doctors to uh, to say here's here's why I ought to be paid higher because of the uniqueness of the surgery because you know better than any of us uh, that each case is different right the experience of the doctor the expertise of the doctor the uh, the challenge of doing whatever the procedure is I'm not a doctor I don't know what what <laughs> what, what uh, I'm you know you don't play what, one on TV no not know. never <laughs> no, no. Uh, look but what doctors do is wonderful and miraculous work sometimes and uh, and always tr tremendous work and we depend on it immensely so we want to make sure we try always in 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 doing a bill like that you have to be mindful of the notion that we want to have the a robust uh medical industry and we want the best doctors around uh and yet we want to make sure that patients get protected you uh, there are there are folks who who could get that bill and be terrified of it we we see it i've seen it you know uh particularly elderly people who are, could be intimidated by it right. and, and don't have the wherewithal to pay the bill. Uh, and so they're paying something that and they- And it scares the bedoodles out of them when they see this absolutely. massive bill. Right. So. And, and remember, it only applies to, in two situations here, in emergent situations, which should be covered, by the way, by your, your carrier anyway. That's the law as it is right, right now for good public policy reasons, right? You get hit by a bus, they don't wake you up and say, hey, what's, what, your, what's your insurance plan? Right. We want to make sure we get to the right hospital. They take you and save your life. Uh, the and and inadvertent situations, those things that I talked about, where you have you need the the services, right? right? Uh, or you have some some something happen to you while you're on the operating table. You're having a knee replacement. You have a heart attack. Right. You want the care. You, you we yeah we do what we can to save your life. So only in those two situations that this applies. Right. So but it was a great success. It took it was ten years in the making. No no it was me. long overdue. Uh, and I think that for the docs, I just want to know that there's going to be some sort of fair way of being able to sit in a, 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 a feeling of equity with insurance companies mm -hmm. when there really is not that level of equity. Right, but that's why the, there's an expedited position, there's rules about what happens in terms of last best offers and, and not being able to reduce their offers and things like Good. that. Good, so. so last uh, uh, questions before we go. You know, I'm a big Devils fan. Devils or, or the Rangers? Well, I, um, I'm older I'm than you, you, so uh, I'm, a, I'm actually a Rangers fan. Oh. I grew with, the, the, well, I'm not, I'm a huge sports guy, as, <laughs> as you well know. Uh, one of my hobbies, we were talking about that with your staff before, is that I get to do the play-by-play -play for right. the Woodbridge High School sports. So, and uh, everyone, my, one of my kids works for the Brooklyn Cyclones, one works for CBS Sports, so, and the other one was the head manager at St. John's Basketball. So we, <laughs> we're huge sports fans, but I'm not a particular hockey fan. I, when I grew up, there wasn't the Devils. No. And, and so now I root for them be, when I can, but I'm a, the, the, the Reverend Rangers were playing the Devils. I and, uh, my son works for the Yankees. The Yankees. I'm a Mets? Yankee. I am a Yankee fan. Although my wife is, a, and my eldest son, who works for the Brooklyn Cyclones, which is a Mets minor league team, have have Mets fans. So oh, we're kind that, of mixed that's up. That's to carry both. Yeah, but I, I'm a Yankee fan because my grandfather, my my dad, I was four. My grandfather 
used to come to our house all the time. He was a Yankee fan, and so I became a Yankee fan. And I'm a, I am a, I'm a Giants fan. Giants fan. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, these are important things. <laughs> they are yeah, very important things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the chance to Thank be here. Thank you. Good to see you again. Okay.